personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo with the Resistance Library Podcast. Now, before we dig in today's subject, I'm going to read you a little poem. Well, I don't know where they come from, but they sure do come. I hope they come in for me. And I don't know how they do it, but they sure do it good. And I hope they do it for free. They give me cat scratch fever. Sam, what do you think of that one? Um, that is like, so there's going to be a lot of me and my personal relationship with Ted Nugent in this. Uh, but that is the first Ted Nugent song that I ever heard as a kid. Uh, one of the first songs I learned how to play on guitar when I was a kid. Um, I love Ted Nugent. I think Ted Nugent is just an absolute national treasure. Um, you know, well, we'll get into some of the weird stuff about Ted Nugent later. Um, but one thing I, I just want to lead with, because I'm I, I, mostly because I don't want to forget it. Um, <laughs> did you know that Ted Nugent was a big influence to bands like Black Flag uh, and particularly Minor Threat, who loved him because he famously has never drank or done drugs in his life? He's really? just weird. He doesn't do anything. He's just weird. He doesn't. He doesn't drink or or do any kind of that stuff. Nothing. Him and him and Gene Simmons, you know, are like the two big. Nope, don't do drugs. Don't drink. Don't smoke cigarettes. Uh, just get high on rock and roll. Kinds of guys. Um, and I think that is one of the coolest things about him. But you know, curiously, like in the kind of like you know pre. Both the, you know, the, the sort of like New York Dolls to Ramones period of American rock and roll and also in the sort of, you know, formative years when American punk rock is changing up and becoming what would later be called hardcore. Um, there wasn't like a ton t- uh, for, for, you know, the musicians at that time to draw on that was recent um, because like for, you know, the people mention stuff like Bowie and Bowie was, people liked him, but he was too weird. Um, there was Lou Reed, you know, but there was, but that was kind of in the dolls and that was kind of in the dictators. And I'm sure that I'm leaving somebody out, but that was kind of it. So you had to, it wasn't like if you were in one of these early punk rock, early hardcore bands that you could just like listen to bands that were also punk rock or hardcore bands because there just weren't enough of them. And, and things were kind of as, you know, siloed and segmented as they later became anyway. Um, but yeah, big favorite of a lot of those guys was Ted Nugent. And if you go back and listen to it, it's, you know, it's, it's heavy, but it's unpretentious. Um, it's got that kind of like boogie swing of original fifties rock and roll to it. Um, and that's a train going by because for once I'm not out in the middle of the woods, but you know, that's, I think, I think that like all, all the things I just said, the punk connection, notwithstanding, I just find that interesting and kind of weird because, you know, I could give you all day to name people and you probably wouldn't pull Ted Nugent out as as a guy who had a huge influence on early American hardcore bands. It's interesting you mentioned Lou Reed because that's more music you would nod off to while you're doing heroin. Yeah, but Lou Reed is like, you know, I mean, first of all, the some of the some of the, you know, you listen to like um early Lou Reed tr- solo tracks or Velvet Underground tracks, you know, some of them have that kind of like nervous punk energy to them. And also like just go watch a Lou Reed interview. You know, the guy is just like so ridiculously antagonistic with the media. Somebody asked him if he liked being a blonde and his answer was, I don't know, do you like being a schmuck? Um, Lou Reed is another guy I love a lot But let's get back to Ted Nugent So Ted Nugent Conservative uh, rock star 
there's not very many in the world. Ted Nugent may be the most prominent um, and probably also the most conservative because a lot of other like, you know, people that you could pull out as conservative rock stars, like say Gene, Gene Simmons. It, it's like, it's less that they're ideologically conservative. It's that like conservatism in the Republican party is sort of the home now for people who have common sense, um, a short fuse for tolerating bullshit and, you know, who are into like sort of free speech and live and let live and, um, that kind of thing. But Ted Nugent is like, he's, he's, he is an ideological conservative, uh, despite being the Motor City madman. He's the third of fourth kids from Red, Redford, Michigan. He grew up in a military family. And boy, this is like, so here's the first, so here we pivot to like weird things that came out of this article. So I'm like, you know, celebrating Christmas and I get an email that's like, hey, somebody at Ted Nugent headquarters wants to talk to you. Uh, Ted wants to talk to you. Whoa. Yeah, it never ended up happening. Oh. Um, and the bummer version of it is that I don't think that he I think that he was like mad at me because um, Ted Nugent did not serve in the Vietnam War. And the like story about why he didn't, you know, changes every three years. And I'm, you know. Somebody in, in Camp Ted may listen to this and get upset about it and they can, you know, go ahead and do that. I don't really care because <laughs> um, the ever shifting goalposts of why Ted Nugent did not serve in Vietnam uh, are very real. And I think kind of give you all the explanation you need, uh, but, you know, whatever. So he's now a member of the United States Marshals Fugitive Felony Task Force. I don't know how that came to be. I kind of wish I did right now. Um, getting back to his, his musical career. Um, I actually was also a big fan a few years later after, you know, my first experience of hearing cat scratch fever on WAAF, um, the only station in Boston that really rocks, even though their transmitters in Worcester. But a few years later I got into, you know, kind of like, um, early, psychedelic rock and like, you know, garage, what they call garage punk and stuff like that. Um, Ted was in a band called the Amboy Dukes who absolutely smoke. Um, and their hit that you may have heard was journey to the center of the mind that if it's not about dropping acid, then I don't know what the hell it's about, but it's certainly not to Ted who, as we mentioned, um, is one of the most notoriously sober rock stars going uh, was cited as the, one of the main ins inspirations for the straight edge movement. And boy, he may have he, felt like he just had to think about that subject back then. I don't think he was the, I don't think he was the singer of the Amboy Dukes. Huh. Cause that's another thing that's weird about Ted Nugent is like, can you think of another band that, or another solo act rather hmm. where the solo act is not the singer. Cause I can't. Right. So there's bands you've got, you know, Van Halen, Santana. There's yeah. probably other ones that I'm thinking of. The only ones that I can think of are, are like eighties shred acts like Joe Satriani, but there's no singer. Yeah, yeah, with no singer, that's the problem. I mean, I'm sure Yo-Yo Ma did some opera concerts where he was a headliner, but that's about the best I can come up with. Yeah, right. So you can't think of like another or another rock band that's a solo act, but the solo act is the guitar player, not the lead singer. Like I can't think of one. And if you and it and the and the amount of time that we'll spend sitting here like, oh, I don't know, yeah. like uh, Yeah, listeners at home, like your answer to the your local congressman. <laughs> And like even Van Halen, it's like it's a band. First of all, there's two, two or three Van Halens in the band. You know, Santana. It's clearly a band because it's not Carlos Santana. Um, I can't think of one. Can't think of one other than Uncle Ted. Um, he does sing now for them. I, I believe he is the singer of the act now. He was this. If I, you know, this was twenty plus years ago that I saw 
Ted Nugent opening for Kiss on what was supposed to be their last tour 20 years ago. <laughs> um, and he lit his guitar on fire and shot it with a compound bow. And before firing the bolt from the bow said, I want to see Ted Kennedy try and take this one away from me. And the crowd went absolutely bonkers when he did this. Uh, yeah. Ted Nugent. Like there's just nobody like him in the entire world of, uh, rock. So the Amboy Dukes are kind of like where his solo project came from. Uh, first they were the Amboy Dukes, then they were Ted Nugent and the Amboy Dukes. And then they just dropped, uh, the Amboy Dukes part of it. And it just was kind of like a pretty seamless transition at the time. We talked about, you know, how he isn't the singer of Ted Nugent, uh, or wasn't originally, you know, the, the classic period of the solo album, uh, the, the sorry, the self-titled free for all and cat scratch fever. Uh, that was Derek St. Holmes, who was just one hell of a singer. And he also was in a super group in the late eighties that the elderly among us may remember called, uh, damn Yankees. They had a second album that was called don't tread, which I'm guessing was probably uh, his suggestion. That was with members of night Ranger and sticks. That is a, in my estimation is a guy who listens to very little music made after 1993, uh, one hell of a couple of albums they did together. So this is all really cool stuff, but like, why, why are like, great. Like, so why are we talking about Ted Nugent? Um, cause he's not just a conservative. He's a very outspoken conservative and he is an advocate for the second amendment and a conservationist, a uh, big supporter of president Donald Trump and Sheriff Joe Arapaio. And he is on the board of the national rifle association. So, I mean, did you know any of this about Ted before we did this? I knew he was conservative. Uh, he pisses off a lot of the right kind of people. I never looked into exactly why, but I just knew he was probably the most famous musician who actually dares say something that wouldn't be supported by the teachers union. And uh, I guess I've always been interested in just what he's done to evoke so much ire. Yeah. I mean, I think that like, um, like you said, he's got, you know, opinions that aren't acceptable to the teachers union, I think is a really um, succinct way of putting it. And also like the understatement of the year he, you know, so kid rock shot a mountain lion and uh, kid rock actually is probably his like successor as yes. He's know, held Trump rallies. Most pro he sells t-shirts on his website that say God guns and Trump. Um, uh, so I think Kid Rock is kind of the like, you know, maybe we maybe I should put it the other way. Ted Nugent is kind of the Kid Rock of, you know, the 70s and the 80s. But yeah, I mean, Ted Nugent came to Kid Rock's defense after he was criticized for shooting a mountain lion. Um, he, he has a wildlife preserve. People call it canned hunting. I'm not going to wade into that debate because I just don't have the like, you know, expertise to determine it one way or the other, but I will say that it's 340 acres. Um, oh, are they upset that people aren't going out into the Savannah in search of their, their, uh, their game. A lot of people don't like, I think that the, I think that the crit is the claim is that the, the, is that it's fenced in. Ah. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not sure if that's true. B I'm not sure at what point does, uh, like wh how much land do you need? before it's not canned hunting. You know what I mean? Like how, how much open land do you, or, or, or is any amount of fencing <clears throat> is not appropriate? I don't know. I mean, somebody else can answer it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not in favor of shooting fish in a barrel, but it's not clear to me that that's what this is, but I, I, it's above my pay grade. He talks about running for public office in his words. He threatens to run for public office, which I think is, a Hmm. Good way of putting it. Um, he's talked about running for governor of Michigan. 
uh, both in 2006 and 2010. The Illinois Republican Party uh, attempted to recruit him as a candidate for Senate in 2004 because I guess he's originally from Illinois. So I doubt he'll ever do it. I mean, he's kind of old now, and I don't know that he would, frankly, be the best candidate. And I think that he's better off, you know, being great gonzo out in the wild than, um, you know, forced into the uh, domestic life of a politician. Yeah, who would want that? I know, it's weird. It's like when people talk. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just, I don't understand why any sane human being would want to run for public office in this country. His policy solution, he mentioned to Imagineer Magazine in 2010, I would fire every government worker whose job I would deem to be redundant and wasteful. No able-bodied human being would ever get a handout again. Neat. Yeah, he's in some ways like really this, you know, throwback to like Archie Bunker type shoot from the hip style of conservatism. You know, they called George Bush the compassionate conservative. I think Ted Nugent is the uncompassionate conservative, (laughs) Um, which, you know, good for him. He talked about running for president in 2016. I'm guessing that that didn't materialize because uh, another, you know, celebrity candidate um, made his presence known during the 2016 election. And I don't remember how he did, but if somebody does, they can, you know, fill us in. He, this is the thing I like about him. And I, and this is like a thing that I like about, you know, entertainers in general, regardless of, of, of their political persuasion or even like the style of music that they play. He has said repeatedly that every gig he plays is the most important of his life. And I only saw him the one time and it was, you know, 20 plus years ago, but I don't doubt it. Cause I think that he just has this like level of intensity that he brings to everything that he does. I think it's probably why he's such a skilled um, guitar player, because I think that he just has this extremely driven um, mindset. I think it's why he never touched drugs because I think he just thought that that was like a distraction and, you know, would dull him in his pursuit of being like, you know, uh, a guitar perfectionist. Um, I think it's also why he doesn't run for public office, despite the fact that I'm sure that that gnaws at him. Um, because I think that it's just, you know, he, if he's not going to be able to do it exactly perfectly, he doesn't want to do it at all. So, and I think that that goes to his, um, his passion for hunting and weapons and survival. I mean, he claims that he could survive forever bare naked in the woods. Uh, if, which, you know, I don't doubt it. Uh, I would not want to get into a fight with Ted Nugent and he's like 70 years old. He's big, big fan of the 10 millimeter, which I am as well. So we've got that in common. You know, the question Ted Nugent really begs is like, I can, list all the celebrities who are publicly conservative. I mean, you got James Woods, you got Chris Pratt, Gene Simmons, like you mentioned, Ted Nugent, and honestly, none other come to mind. Why have artists monopolized, or why has liberalism monopolized artists? Why are there so few exceptions to the rule that they're all going to go on uh, on The View and endorse you know, Tulsi Gabbard and is it just because the media wouldn't give a platform to the very few conservative celebrities? Is there something about being artistic that inclines one to, to vote Dem? I mean, what, what is the uh, underlying mindset of the artist here that has given us so few conservative rock stars and actors? Well, I think that, you know, I mean, first of all, the whole, like, I mean, if people remember, four years ago that there was like, you know, Hollywood was threatening to like not make movies. If Donald Trump was elected president, it's like, Oh, cool. So that means for the next 
four years, the only people making movies are going to be, you know, Kurt Russell, um, John Voight, Clint Eastwood, Vince Vaughn, and Mel Gibson. Oh, no. Don't punish me, please. Uh, I don't know. I so, saw the mule, and that put me to sleep. If, people at home, if you want to watch Clint Eastwood driving a truck for 90 minutes, go watch the mule. Man, I, that actually sounds really good to me. Uh, but, yeah, I think, first of all, there's more of it than you think. I think that, second of all, there's probably even more that we don't know about because people keep their head down and just play the game. I mean, I have a friend who I won't give too many details on, but who's very famous. He's well, he's internet famous, you know, which is like reasonably famous. Um, and he just plays a game. And I know what his real beliefs about the world are and how much at variance they are with the image that he projects to the world around him. And I don't fault him for it one bit. Hmm. Um, so there's more of them out there than we would expect, suspect. Probably a lot of that going on. Um, I also think that, yeah, to a certain extent, it does select for um, a certain personality type. Yeah. Though I don't think that, that personality type is necessarily um, liberal or left-leaning I think actually the personality type that it tends to select for now is compliant, you know, uh, but I think that in earlier ages where, you know, where the entertainment and industry and the media ecosystem uh, and the playing field of ideas were not so rigidly and rigorously controlled, you had people who were, you know, much more, just sort of open to new ideas was the thing that was being selected for. And I think the thing that they select for now is much more ideological compliance. Um, three people that kind of ran through my head while we were talking about this is Salvador Dali, who most people don't know was like a gig a rabid supporter of Francisco Franco in Spain, um, you know, just as a, for instance, uh, you know, Ezra pound was like jailed by the allied forces when they arrested him in Italy. Cause he'd been giving radio addresses in, in support of Mussolini. And I think that Ezra pound is probably the greatest poet of the last hundred years. And that Salvador Dali is maybe like the best painter in human history. Jack Kerouac, who everyone thinks was some big hippie peacenik icon, was like rabidly pro Vietnam War and arch conservative Catholic mm. and thought that the greatest president ever was Herbert Hoover. Huh. He might be the only one. Uh, yeah, I know, but he's he loved, he loved Herbert Hoover. I believe um, John Steinbeck was in favor of the Vietnam War, too. Steinbeck was a Steinbeck supported the Vietnam War. Um, John Dos Passos was a disgruntled socialist who voted for Richard Nixon. Um, I mean, there's a lot more of them than you think, especially when you start kind of detouring out of like recent pop culture. I mean, I don't, I don't think we have to go back to like the French Revolution or anything here. I think that there's like plenty of Titanic figures from. 20th century pop culture or, you know, the arts and literature who are ideologically conservative to like sort of embarrassingly right wing, like Ezra Pound and his love of, you know, Mussolini. Here's a weird one. Eric Clapton's politics are like sort of are like sort of fascist huh. um yeah I, I never heard those undertones in his music yeah eric clapton is like a I, I i i i don't this is not a word that i throw around but like eric clapton is a racist he's like an open ideological racist um and has no trouble saying it you know so uh, especially when you, you, which is like surprising to a lot of people, particularly 
given his love of like, you know, blues music and everything. And I'm not like holding these people up as, you know, paragons of virtue and ideological rigor or, you know, anything to be emulated. Um, I hate that I have to like give that disclaimer, but I suppose I probably should. Yes, but <laughs> we we don't endorse racism on this podcast. Yeah, we don't. We're not endorsing Mussolini or you know, um, or 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 Eric Clapton's statements about keeping Britain white. Which yeah, Google that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we are, we are in favor of the of Pol Pot that. and the Khmer Rouge, but outside of that, we're <laughs> we're not endorsing. Anyone. I mean, yeah. So I think that like. I mean, they also, you know, we mentioned Bowie earlier, like there was a whole period where like Bowie was, you know, talking about how, how cool fascism was in the seventies. I think that mostly, yeah. So to kind of like put a bow on this, I think that really the issue is that people have decided that they don't, that they don't want their edgy artists to be quite so edgy anymore. We had like the biggest technical difficulties we've ever had on this show just now. So if there's like a, you know, change in my over caffeinated tone, that's why. But so I think that like the main thing is that people have decided that they don't want their edgy musicians and entertainers to be quite so edgy anymore. Or, you know, the powers that be have decided that anyway. And then I think that it's basically like not because, you know, who's the who's the like far left entertainer you know or band or whatever like there's there's there there aren't any they have these like you know absurd uh social liberal positions but like no one is you know there's not like a rock band that's like let's bring out the guillotines in on wall street and start sticking you know billionaires heads on pikes no um but there is a market for that kind of music. There must be some underground bands calling for, you know, impaling Ed Meese. Yeah, and I'm sure that there, I'm sure that there are, just as there are, you know, like bands that are on the, uh, you know, and entertainers and whatever that are sort of more. I mean, Vincent Gallo is like another. Vincent Gallo loves Donald Trump. He loved George W. Bush. Um, I love Vincent Gallo. But yeah, I think that it's basically just that. You know, to make it in Hollywood today, it's not so much that you have to be like politically left wing as such. You just have to, you know, mouth all the shibboleths of this, you know, sort of corporatist, you know, neoliberal, socially uh, insane liberal, um, but, you know, no actual attacks on anyone in, in, in power. It's like, you know, no, it's unwoke white flyover uh proles and small town cops that you know are the problem with the world not uh anyone who's in an ac- any actual position of power and i think that like to kind of bring it back you know i think that that's why you know why there's not more guys like ted nugent because i don't think i think that the conservatism doesn't help but i think that it's ultimately just that he's you know he's a wild man He's crazy. He's a crazy person. I mean that in the best possible way, you know, like he's, he's, he's a little different than his, just the way his head works is a little different than most people. And it touches, you know, the stuff I was talking about earlier about just how driven and everything he is. Um, it's part of that, you know, the normal average person walking around the world today is not like driven to become the world's best guitar player and treating a, uh, you know, gig in front of 150 people at the Kenosha fair as it's the most important gig he's they've ever played in their lives. And I think that, yeah, like the thing that our entertainment selects for now is, 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 is people that are much more conformist where in the sixties when he was coming up, it was a bit more of a, a bit more of a wild West thing. I mean, he makes like lots of pretty crazy statements, which again, like, I'm not saying they're crazy, like, and it's a bad thing. I'm, you know, it's like, I like, I like that about him. I think that there's a vitality and a realness to Ted Nugent, you know, like it's not, it's crazy. It's only crazy because it's a famous person saying it, you know, Ted Nugent doesn't say anything that you wouldn't hear in a like Flint, Michigan bar on a Friday night. So is there just no market for these kinds of entertainers or are they, are they being flat out? suppressed so to speak by uh 
you know, giant multi-billion dollar media corporate interests. Um, I think that there's a, I think that there's a market for them, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of what the public is given in terms of its, its corporate media is not what they actually want. It's what they're being told that they're going to, um, listen to or watch or whatever. And that there's not really a, you know, conservative, um, poll of attraction in popular culture anywhere. I mean, there's like the, the kind of like handfuls that we're talking about, but they're conspicuous because they're so, because they're outliers. Yeah. You know, Ted Nugent is, if, if there was like a sort of counter recording industry that was for, you know, red America, um, t- that was, that was actually like a real thing that, that people listened to. And that was a sort of counter weight to Hollywood. You know, I don't think that Ted Nugent, I mean, Ted Nugent would still be prominent cause he's like, he's been around for 50 years, but like, you know, I don't think that I can't think of a good example, but like, it wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't even be talking about it in these terms. It would just be like, you know, I watch movies from the studio that Mel Gibson runs or, you know, Clint Eastwood or something like that. So Ted Nugent, um, his name is on some hunting ammunition that came from Pierce ammunition that sadly is, uh, now defunct. You can still, there was plans to get 10 Nugent ammunition in 357 mag, 10 millimeter, 44 mag, nine millimeter, 45 long Colt, 223, 308, 30, 30. 30 aught six, uh, you know, everything you can imagine that's good for hunting. Um, <laughs> cause there is, there's still ammunition that's endorsed by like, you know, Stephen Rinella from meat eater and, uh, and what's his face from swamp people. But the idea of having rockstar branded ammunition, I'm surprised kiss didn't try that. I want to go black bear hunting with my Hornady FTX kiss edition ammo. Yeah. I mean, kiss, Kiss will put their name on anything, and I, I'm I'm right there with you because I would think that there'd be a lot of um, you know people who would be into buying Kiss ammo, myself included. So <laughs> I, I, I love I this. I want qu- Ed Kennedy's brand uh, Carsano ammo. <laughs> I wouldn't hold my That's breath for that, <laughs> but I, I I love the quote. So there's a quote from Ted Nugent in the. Uh, press release for this ammo that you know you can't get anymore and we're i'm going to quote it verbatim because i love it and it's like it's 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 just it's so ted so uncle ted it was psycho babbler abraham maslow who wrote of the phenomenon of self-actualization what maslow failed to grasp is that reaching true self-actualization can only be ultimately achieved when you have your own brand of ammunition <laughs> yeah great killer <laughs> um in the article i mentioned two other people who were you know uh conservative uh rock musicians that we didn't mention before and that was uh, elvis presley who famously met with richard nixon um, because he wanted to like bust drug users in the rock scene in the late sixties, which is funny for a lot of reasons. One huh. of which is that he was, he was doing so many drugs <laughs> and the other, of which is that like how many rock musicians was Elvis hanging out with in the late sixties, you know, <laughs> like, um, and Johnny Ramone, Johnny Ramone, there's a really cool picture of the Ramones hanging out in front of a uh, in front of a graffiti that says "Vote Communist, Vote Socialist Workers Party," and they're all giving it thumbs down. And the fun and the funniest part of it is that Joey, the singer, who was the only one who was kind of liberal, like the rest of them were just you know kind of outer borough New York Guidos with the conservative politics that come along with that. Um, but Joey was the liberal and, and Joey's kind of like less enthusiastically giving it a thumbs down. Um, but yeah, G- Johnny Ramone used to wear a kill a commie for mommy t-shirt all the time. And people would like in interviews go, aha, uh-huh, that's funny. And he's like, it's, it's not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wearing this as a joke. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just trying to picture Taylor Swift doing the same thing. 
Yeah, Taylor Swift is a bummer because she was like, you know, she was an icon for a lot of reasons and then kind of, you know, decided that the, the, the woke bucks were uh, where it was at. And, you know, good for her. I'm never going to uh, never going to fault anyone for. Yeah. Well, I mean, getting that least, money. Surely her 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 agents whole uh, whole idea. I mean, the girl probably had a huge amount of influence on her public image, I'm sure. But. Someone told her to uh, kind of jump ship, so to speak. Kind of like uh, Angelina Jolie. I mean, she always struck me as a real wackading hoy lunatic. She wore Billy Bob Thornton's blood in a vial around her neck. Had, uh, That's awesome. Had John, <laughs> had John Voight for a dad. And then I swear, some some publicist said, look, your new image is Mother Goose. You're going to uh, disavow all that stuff and adopt uh Adopt the planeteers and and get all your organs removed, and you're going to be uh, beloved. Yeah, I I, th- I mean I think that this all kind of uh, speaks to what I was talking about earlier that like people just people slash the powers that be because I don't think that it's a you know I do think that it's a kind of like bi directional thing that there's interplay between both what the market wants and what the market's given. You know, there's just not like we don't have edgy entertainers anymore. We have these kind of like faux edgy entertainers, but like no one is really either breaking ground creatively or sort of, you know, espousing opinions outside of the norm. And in the and in the weird event that they accidentally do, you know, they're going to hop right back into conformity lickety split. Uh, the second that, you know, the commissars inform them that they have expressed uh, the correct opinion from last week instead mm-hmm. of this week. I mean, I think that, like, here's a good quote, another good quote from Uncle Ted. I'm not in the leftist controlled rock and roll hall of fame because of my political views, primarily my lifelong militant support of the NRA, the Second Amendment, and my belief that the only good bad guy is a dead bad guy. I, I find that difficult to dispute, you know, like I, I can't think of any other reason why Ted Nugent wouldn't be in the rock and roll hall of fame. Yeah. Um, I, there's a lot, there's a lot of people who should be in the rock and roll hall of fame that aren't. There's a lot of like people that they kind of got around to adding, you know, I, I hate the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, man. No, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame sucks. It I mean, absolutely I mean, sucks. Okay, here's my idea for a museum, all right? I'm not going to let some people into it for no reason at all. And then one year, I'll say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm letting this guy in. Put me in the news. And they get this big media blitz every time they say, oh, we decided to let the Beatles in this year. And it's just so, so phony. It's such a marketing move every time you hear about them. I mean, I've been to the museum. The museum is pretty cool. Um, I, went, I was this was like twenty five years ago that I went to the museum, and I liked it a lot. Um, you know, I don't know if I would like it now, but I did then. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always like weird. Uh, I don't know if they fi- finally put Def Leppard in or not, but like, there's always this weird bias against like hard rock in general. Like Judas Priest isn't in, and Motorhead isn't in. Yeah, they probably cheap, don't want cheap, their fans there, destroying the gift shop and getting drunk in the parking lot. Cheap Trick was only put in very recently. Roxy Music, I may or may not be in. If they're in, it's very, very recent. You know, there's all these like musicians that if you're going to make a museum of uh, a Hall of Fame of rock and roll, you know, these are the bands that should be in them. But meanwhile, you know, like Public Enemy is in there. Just like I have nothing against Public Enemy. Um, it's just like if there's if, if we're going to have rap groups in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, are we going to have what we're going to put the Sex Pistols in the Rap Hall of Fame? It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, it's, it is very much just this like cash grabbing thing from Jan Wenner, who's a who's a dick. Um, yeah, I can't think of any reason why Ted Nugent wouldn't be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame other than his politics. I mean, he was huge in the 70s, um, huge in the 70s, big, like big concert draw. You know, he was like the the man who in, who invented the the like every third album is going to be a double live thing. Uh, Double Live Gonzo is great. Intensity in 10 Cities is great. Uh, Weekend Warriors is great. It's not necessarily his best, but it's got him 
wielding a machine gun shaped like a guitar on the cover. Sweet. Um, which is which is pretty great. I mean, his seventies output, like in my estimation, you just can't really go wrong with it. He's an amazing guitar player. He's an amazing songwriter. Um, but you know, throw it on while you and your buddies are plinking in the backyard with some ammo that you got from ammo.com forward slash podcast where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. I know that ammo is getting a little hard to pick up again these days. And I think that, uh, you know, if you're looking and you want to get some stuff in bulk, we love doing bulk sales on ammo.com. Um, so go ahead, check that out. Thanks again for listening to the resistance library podcast from ammo.com for Dave Trello. This is Sam Jacobs and we will see you next time. 